Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the fashion world and what it's doing to bring together companies from around the world to focus on the United Nations, some of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, especially those to create clean energy and to empower women. My guest today is going to bring us up to date on this very interesting project. Kara Smith is Vice President of the Glasgow Caledonian University of New York, and she is the founding director of the Fair Fashion Center. Kara, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. We're going to get into the Fair Fashion in just a moment. Let's talk about the Ca Glasgow Caledonian University. Yes. What exactly is that, and when was it? Form, why is it formed and yeah. why is it in New York and not in Scotland? Okay, so. <laughs> or maybe in both uh, places. Both, actually. Okay. So uh, Glasgow Caledonian University is a 144-year-old university based in Scotland, obviously in Glasgow. Uh, the motto of the university is University for the Common Good, actually in Old Scots for the Common Wheel, which is something that we all take very seriously. 50% uh, of the students in uh, Glasgow actually are first time in their family to university, which is quite exciting. And we really have a very strong focus on people, planet, and profit, if you will. Uh, we like to say we've been in that business a long time, over 144 years. Uh, Mohammed Yunus is actually the Chancellor Emeritus of the university and was there just as I joined. And Annie Lennox is our current Chancellor, which is also very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, on why we are we are in New York? So the university has a uh, campus in London and now in New York and other partnership locations around the world. We have housed 20,000 students actually. Uh, but here in New York in particular, we became the very first foreign university ever to be chartered by the Department of Education. And I think that is because of the fair fashion work and how we are bringing the common good work to life. Uh, here in New York City. So we have a campus based in Soho uh, where we teach master's students and, and much about how business can deliver on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, that's interesting because you came to the United States. Usually the United States exports are yes. higher education <laughs> anyway, at the very in least. Fact, so fact. that's it's a bit of a turnaround. It is a turnaround. It was, I think, <laughs> a surprise that uh, a foreign university actually could be chartered. And mm -hmm. uh, now we're on our way to middle states accreditation and able to welcome foreign students, which is very exciting. And I think really this idea of how a university can transform uh, lives, communities, and businesses through education and research is near and dear to the university's heart. And so we're very excited about bringing particularly this to action in, in New York here. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned Mohammed Yunus, yes. and many of our viewers will remember that Mohammed Yunus was the creator, uh, really an icon, in creating the Grameen Bank, yes. which provided low, well, low sum loans to poor people, primarily women, yes. and it just had a remarkable career as far as empowering women to develop their own businesses, be it sewing or perhaps uh, farming or whatever the case might be. But he, he is really a legend in this area. He is, he is. So he started Grameen Bank mm -hmm. and the idea of micro lending, um, mm -hmm. that it was possible to bank what were considered unbankable women particularly, and they would reinvent themselves and pay back their loans. And he's actually one of only seven in the world to have won Nobel Peace Prize, Congressional Gold and Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is quite amazing. And I think early on when we were looking at what is the possibility of the fashion industry to deliver on the UN's goals, it was just after the Rana Plaza factory collapse, which was in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. Professor Yunus is Bangladeshi, 1,200 apparel industry workers were killed there. And I think at that time, six years ago, the industry really started to say, we know we have to change practices. How do we do it? How do we clean up our supply chains? And how do we really use our business as a force for good? And so the university kind of took that up here in New York by launching um, and creating what is now the Fair Fashion Center, which is an applied research center really to uh, facilitate the incorporation of sustainable practices into industry, whether it be fashion or, or otherwise. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with Professor Yunus, and, and he helped us bring together CEOs early on in discussion, which was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. And that, w that was a terrible tragedy in Bangladesh, but that is endemic, I think, of the garment industry in many areas of the yeah. world. But hopefully it's getting better, and I know you're concerned about it. I know UN agencies, the International Labor Organization in particular, yes. has been very involved in focusing the spotlight on that. So it's very important to keep the keep the uh, focus on that so we can help improve that particular part of the industry. So 
Uh, now, were you involved in setting up the Fair Fashion I operation? Was. Okay. How did you get involved? So uh, I founded the Fair Fashion Center, and it really came, I think, um, it links very much to the United Nations, to the university's common good mission, but really coming out of the fashion industry, which I did, which was my background. Uh, and early on when I joined the university, after the conversations initially with Professor Yunus around what is fashion's power and so on to deliver on what is now the SDGs, really looking at the SDGs and seeing how much um, impact <coughs> fashion had really across all of the 17 goals, sort of stunned us, I think, for those of us that were not thinking so much of industry as an instrument, and then really looking at everything from gender equality to uh, education, to the water, to the chemicals, to the climate impacts, and so on, and uh, responsible consumption and production. We saw ourselves in so many of the goals, but we also didn't really see the how-to guide. So if I was still sitting in my fashion CEO seat at that time, and being called on to be a corporate statesman, I think the roadmap to doing that is still quite difficult. You know, sustainability is complicated, a lot of tangled issues, particularly in fashion. Um, I always say fashion's bad numbers. You know, we're widely believed to be responsible for 20% industrial wastewater, 10% carbon emissions. We have between 70 and 80% women in our supply chain. So really looking at those facts and figures and thinking about our opportunity, we wondered, how could companies be better facilitated? How could we give them the tactics and the how-to guides? Because fashion companies, uh, as a good friend says, I don't have a VP of greenhouse gases, and I don't have a director of gender equity in the supply chain. So not having a skill set inside a fashion company then makes it difficult to gain knowledge, align oneself properly with proper mm -hmm. partners. How does one determine which are the priority issues and areas particularly because the funny thing about fashion is we're a mobile industry, you know, different than a Pepsi. We keep changing production locations, we change product every six weeks, and that makes us wonderfully hardwired to change for the better, but also presents a number of challenges. So the Fair Fashion Center really mm -hmm. is there to incubate actionable business solutions and translate SDGs and the worlds of nonprofit and even the finance community into a language that the companies can readily pick up uh, and incorporate into systemic change. Mm -hmm. Before I go too far, I want to mention your website. It's gcnyc.com backslash Fair Fashion Center. Yeah, yes, I great. hope yes, this is you. right. Thank you, thank yes, you. Yes, that was a very good overview of what you're doing. We'll go back and unpack a little bit of this as we yeah. go along. Uh, do we have any idea of how many companies we're talking about around the world? We're talking about fashion outlets and fashion yeah. designers and companies devoted to this. We're, we're, uh, it's a huge number, I'm sure. It's a huge you, number. Uh, how many do you think are out there and how many are you dealing with? So uh, how many are out there? A ballpark right? figure. Ballpark <laughs> figure. Um, people say that there are 2,000 key mills that are making mm -hmm. a great uh, majority of fashion's fabrics, actually, and thousands and thousands of of cut and sew factories around the world. You know, in Bangladesh alone, there was a study that said there are 7,500 factories there. So if you take that the world over, you know, tens of thousands of factories. Uh, in our case in particular, we actually work with 40 CEOs on this collective action agenda. Um, and they represent 246 brands, about $260 billion in business, which is around 11% of the global industry. So mm -hmm. that's just a narrow slice. Um, but when you think of the ripple effect of a group like that to actually affect change when we're thinking about what are our practices or <coughs> what are some concrete systems change solutions. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the UN is very much involved. UNFCCC is, uh, has a, a climate accord with fashion companies helping to deliver on certain standards to deliver the COP agreements and so on. There's a new fashion alliance also uh, uh, just coming out in Nairobi. So there's a lot of conversation about this. But I think we're all looking at things that sound wonderful, like cross-disciplinary action to deliver systems change. How do you actually do that? We're going to get into that <laughs> <laughs> in just a moment. I know you got the answer. You mentioned the FCCC, the framework for the Convention on Climate Change, yes. as I recall. I think it's yes. something like that. Yes, yes, those yes. UN acronyms. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Th this is an extremely important area. And uh, Well, let's just go into it. How do you do this interdisciplinary type of overview and interaction to focus on these problems and to bring the key players together and to deal with these particular issues and to make 
it, uh, well, the working conditions and uh, more desirable to reduce the possibility of uh, contributing to climate change, which we come to find out now that uh, even the cosmetic industry uh -huh. is contributing immensely to climate change. And most, uh, maybe I'm the only one in the country, in the world, that never thought that was the case, but it certainly is the case as we've discovered. But how do you do that, uh, this interdisciplinary arrangement to bring all these key players together and to cross that bridge, so to speak? I guess I think there are wonderful layers and an amazing collision of priorities today. So what we're seeing is the UN's agenda is being delivered. If we think about the FCCC really concentrating on can we reduce greenhouse gases by 30%, how do we use preferred fibers rather than conventional. So the list of actions that it will take in a concrete manner to deliver on the UN's goals through an industry-like fashion, once that agenda is set, then I think on the back end of that comes what are the tactics, what are the projects, what are the working groups really that can deliver those things. Uh, one of the big issues that we've been working on um, is a project that's been kind of nicknamed NOCO for no carbon dioxide or no CO2 that we've been working on for several years with many of the brands and Rockefeller Foundation, also the United Nations ILO Better Work Program in factories and so on. Um, and that really is a double impact solution initiative. How can we retrofit fashions factories and mills with renewable energy taking a slice of the savings generated by converting away from unclean energy and direct that towards women's education in the supply chain. So trying to really have a program that allows for double impact to deliver on the goals that are being made either through the alliances or through the UN or even investor demands, mm -hmm. if you will too, um, and consumer demands. We're, like I said, we're finding a fantastic collision of priorities where we all recognize this one human family on one common planet and how do we band together to create that change and fashion like I said we're hardwired for change and reflect and drive cultural influence which is fantastic so I think beauty fashion Hollywood uh, our media as well we have a unique positioning and can maybe lead actually in many senses on driving a certain change consumers are asking for that for sure I think they are <laughs> there's no doubt about it they certainly are well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you like our shows, and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service at no cost to help people better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at the fashion industry and the role it can play in helping to promote clean energy, to empower women, and to do many other things too to help create a better world. My guest today is Kara Smith. She's the Vice President of the Glasgow Caledonian University of New York, and she's the Founding Director of the Fair Fashion Center. Kara, we're talking about the fashion industry and bringing, you said you had 40 CEOs, I believe, who are involved in this. Do you have a code of ethics? Do you have a, uh, a gu some guidelines? Do you have some principles you're using? Are you using the UN Sustainable Development Goals? I don't know, that may be part of your, your code of ethics, but do you have it laid out to where you're trying to achieve certain goals? So uh, the UN's, UN SDGs, I would say, provides the North Star for all of us. And I think the UN has done so much work to establish the standards on human rights, also things on climate. The United Nations Global Compact that the university is a part of also has principles and standards. There's PRI, the principles of responsible investing, which collides with our world. Uh, the university is actually part of PRIME, which is the principles of responsible management education. So we really take all of those guidelines into account. And together with the industry, we wanted to take an honest look at what are our impacts and how do we address them. Uh, in part, we did that sort of through the lens of Wall Street and what is being looked at as a material business risk today. But I think fashion's raw materials, the growing and grazing and conversion of raw materials are probably 50% of our impacts. 
Um, and then if you look at the livelihoods in the supply chain is key. The trash, unfortunately, that we create, whether that be end of season or end of use or packaging, is also very important. Um, and then, of course, all of the environmental impacts that we have through the manufacturing process, whether that be the chemicals and so on. I wish fashion didn't roll up into so many of the SDGs like we do, but everything from biodiversity to water and the chemicals that we put out the back of the factories and so on, we touch a lot of them. Um, so we really have aligned around very key issues. What can we do to reduce our inputs, chemicals, water, packaging, and so on, and large-scale solutions, as I said, kind of like this no-co, um, which is this retrofitting of factories and mills and, and being sure that we're supporting the workforce for gender equality and proper education. Mm -hmm. And of course, by being involved in so many of the sustainable development goals, it shows that you have a critical role to play yeah. <laughs> in helping to, well, reduce or eliminate poverty, to reduce hunger, to empower women, to provide clean oceans, to combat climate change, just on across the board, to work with like, uh, I think it's number eight or seven or eight, I can't remember now, to promote safe working conditions, exactly. that type of thing. And when we get into this, we're, uh, we've just scratched the surface, obviously, but there's so many other tangential issues that are related to this, especially in the garment industry, not alone to the garment industry, but you have a variety of things, such as human trafficking that's involved there. You have international labor standards to just on across the board. And I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned the Global Compact a minute mm -hmm. ago. Now this is a UN agency. It was, I think it came out of a 1999 Davos Economic mm -hmm. Forum. Uh, former Secretary General Kofi Annan created exactly. it, as I recall. With Georg and Hill, yeah. he, uh, th this is a very interesting group, a very interesting organization within the UN. And it brings together, the last count I had was about over 10,000 mm -hmm. companies from the United States and around the world who sign on to these voluntary guidelines mm -hmm. to respect uh, workers' rights, to promote human rights, to fight corruption, to be a, for work on anti-corruption programs, to uh, promote sustainable development. How do, do your 40 folks and some of the others tie into the Global Compact? Are they Many of them members do. of the? Of Many it? of them are actually part of the Global Compact. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's quite interesting because strangely, particularly the fashion industry like many, but fashion is very often the first step out of poverty. So if we think about agriculture jobs, manufacturing jobs, even retail jobs, uh, the first step maybe into the workforce often comes through fashion. And the Global Compact has been fantastic because uh, it's it was through the Global Compact that businesses actually got a voice in the United Nations. So many of our companies align to those principles, which is of critical importance. So I think everybody sees the UN as sort of the North Star. Um, and then it's how do we help the brands and companies really have the tactics to deliver what it is that the UN is calling on us to deliver. Mm -hmm. And the UN really is the epicenter of the world to a large degree. Uh, there may be several epicenters, but uh, the UN is absolutely critical to bring the 193 countries of the world mm -hmm. together. And it's uh, just unbelievable the number of conferences that are held at the United Nations mm -hmm. under this roof, bringing together CEOs from all different types of industries, yeah. high tech industries from the garment industry, bringing together celebrities like uh, George Clooney, Mike, Michael Douglas, mm -hmm. people like that to lend their names to UN programs, Angelina Jolie, I think, uh -huh. working with the High Commission for Refugees, but you have so many of these leaders in the world who are, that do come to the United Nations in New York and elsewhere around the world to get involved in these programs to try to help create this better world. And of course, you mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them, and you're, you're tying into to most of them. What do you anticipate will happen in the future? What do you see as your major challenge mm. as you move forward to dealing with these problems? So wh what we found is very interesting is um, what we like to call the in-between space. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are knowledge gaps, let's say, in each of the areas and the stakeholder groups in order to deliver the goals. So I think the UN speaks its language. Industry speaks another language, you know, the industry of fashion and the way that it works. And then if we think about finance, talking more environmental, social, and governance, and blended financing mechanisms, and catalytic capital in order to drive new solutions. And then we think about the nonprofits that speak more about specific issues and have the expertise there. It's almost as if we all have to take a little hop into the center, into this in-between space, because we each have great expertise in our own lane or in an our own area. 
but if we're going to really drive change, we need to be considering each of those areas, including science and science-based target setting and planetary boundaries, and how do we finance those solutions in order to bring them to scale? And that takes great collaboration. Um, so I think probably one of the greatest challenges that are facing all of us is we have to uh, be working for the common good, kind of you know, mm -hmm. back to the, the motto of the university, rather than each working for our own, uh, whether it's an industry or whether it's our own business or whether it's our own university. We all have to really let values rule the day right now if we're going to deliver on the goals. And sometimes I think that's a challenge for all of us to, to do so. Mm -hmm. And, the go well, the challenges are daunting. There's no yes. doubt about that. But the goals are very admirable, and there's 17 of them, and they're running from 2016 through 2030. Yes. And the idea is to really bring all the entities around the world, everybody, service clubs like Rotary International, Optimus, uh -huh. Lions, groups like yours, bring together labor unions, faith-based groups, every yes. every person on this planet's got an interest in this, and it's absolutely critical that we focus on these, and most people are very agreeable to them. They yeah. you know there's logical goals, they're measurable goals, they're achievable goals, mm -hmm. and the idea is to bring people together to focus on this. As, as you look at this, it is, I'm sure they all are important to you, but does climate change sort of rise above uh, the others as far as being a major challenge that we're dealing with? It seems that every conversation I have with anybody, mm -hmm. we always go back to climate change and how we've got to get a handle on what is happening because we're not winning the battle <laughs> against yes. climate change, yeah. I, at least according to the scientists and the scientific studies. Exactly. So does that rise a little above some of the others? I think, you know, we uh, all saw last year and it was sort of another shock to, I think, the IPCC report, which said, the oh, there. The Governmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, right? Yes. yes. 12 years to go before irreversible changes right. start to <coughs> be solidified. And we'll all be alive then. And I think the accountability to say climate change is less and less abstract. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we talk about greenhouse gases and a lot of things, and that's sort of hard to get your hands around. And then we see what's happening with serious weather events around the world and so on. So I think it has become less abstract and more real to folks. And I think understanding how little time there is for us to take great action is driving lots of grassroots initiatives, lots of major league initiatives or systems change initiatives, if you will. So I think climate change is up there and probably tied with uh, gender equity because I think those two things kind of come together. You know, there was the book Drawdown that said women's education is the number six greatest mitigator of climate, which is fantastic because women build resilient communities. So those two things maybe go hand in hand. And I think kind of if we look at the goals and we think about women and then we think about education and decent work and so on, there's a cluster of those goals that come together. And that's a little bit the same on climate. When we're looking at climate, particularly as an industry responsible for the industrial wastewater and, and climate change, you know, then you think about what about the water, which is also related, what about consumption, responsible consumption uh, patterns and production patterns. And so, you know, we kind of roll into clusters, both on women's women and women's education and also then on the climate side. Mm -hmm. In the last 30 seconds we have, do you find that the businesses are becoming much more receptive to being involved in this and to want to be more of um, corporately corporate socially responsible, so to speak, as opposed to maybe 20, 30, 40 years. You weren't there 40 years yeah. ago, but anyway, as to their mindset then, do you find that they're I much more cooperative today? Absolutely do. I think that CEOs are very much interested in doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always kind of this challenge of how do you maximize shareholder value while you're worried about sustainable development goals. But I think there's a particular new, maybe not so new, but over the last five, six years, the interest from Wall Street and investors to say, if you're growing your cotton in an area of water stress areas, or you're producing in an area of geopolitical risks, or you are polluting, all of those things are material risks to an investor. And I think the pressure coming from the investment community to say to brands and companies, we want you to be cleaner, greener, and more respectful is an additional driver that is creating more and more change. And the outcry from consumers and the civil disobedience and the civil unrest that we're seeing, and rightfully so, there's a demand both from the investment side and from the consumer side to drive change. And I think the companies are really looking to be facilitated and educated uh, over and above the things that they're already doing, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, we have 
according to the scientists, about 12 years to get a handle on what's going on, or we will be over the, we will just be beyond the return. We will not be able to turn back, and it's absolutely critical that we do this because there is, as uh, a couple of secretaries general at the UN have said, there's no planet B, exactly. and we're on this Earth together, and we're going to have to make it work. And if we can't do that, we're going to have an uninhabitable Earth. And a lot of people are predicting by 2100 or maybe even sooner that we're going to be in that particular shape, but hopefully we won't. But Kara Smith, I want to thank you so thank very you. much. Thank you for having for me. It was such a pleasure. Very interesting with and you. a very informative thank program. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. Thank Appreciate you. it. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.